Hi folks, just before we roll the interview with Scott Kelby, Andy here to say uh, if you're following this photo life on YouTube, Facebook, when I upload the uh, audio podcast with a nice little video placeholder so you can hear it in those channels, that instead of continuing with the early episodes going out first, so episode one and two have gone out, even have an intro with the wife on number two, uh, I'm going to release these latest episodes as they happen. So they go out on Wednesday on the audio side of things for This Photo Life on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcast, among others. Search for it and please subscribe. But don't worry, they'll continue on the Sunday to be uploaded uh, after that episode has aired a few days. So just a little bit of filing notes. Uh, you know, it's mainly to get things out as they're fresh. I think it just makes more sense while everything's, you know, feeling alive and new for that chat I have with whoever I have, even myself. Uh, and at the same time, like this interview with Scott Kelby, well, Scott's got a Paris workshop coming up. And with only a few places left, I'd feel silly if I got this out even, you know, three, five, ten weeks from now. Um, what if you missed that spot because you only just heard about it? So, boring filing stuff for this opening video of This Photo Life. And with that, the intro of the podcast covers everything about Scott, and we go from there. So why don't we get to it? Enjoy. I can't believe how deep we're going in this interview today, right? This was, this is, we're going in all kinds of uh, wild places that I don't normally get to talk about. You were crazy enough to say yes. Hey folks, welcome to This Photo Life. I'm your host, Andy McSweeney, and here we are. Thank you for being a part of it. I'm guessing there's a few new ears on the podcast show today on the listener side, because of course today, folks, we have an interview with Scott Kelby. I think a lot of you know who he is, but in case you don't, he's author of over 80 photography books, focusing largely on editing, but certainly not exclusively. He's a Photoshop instructor since 1993, and he was one of the first people online in the video sense to give you some help with your Photoshop. Since 2001, he opened Kelby Training, which is now Kelby One, an instruction network with so many fantastic photographers I could spend the whole episode listing off there. And of course, since 2011, he's the host of the online weekly video show on photography known as The Grid. And kids, in case these numbers aren't uh, resonating with you, Scott's got a couple gray hairs and he's been doing this for a long time. So we have a bit of a legend on the show and I could not be happier about it. To be honest, I'm still kind of tripping it happened at all. I don't know Scott super well or anything, but well, we've had a bit of contact over the years. I've hosted a few of his worldwide photo walks, which is another good thing of his you should check into. And uh, well, just here and there, we popped an email or a tweet back and forth. And when I started up uh, last year again with this photo life, I put him on the list of guests I'd love to have on the show. So here we are a year later and it's actually happened. It was a really good chat in my opinion. We talked a lot uh, about Scott himself, which actually was my goal for the interview. I think uh, Scott's been interviewed enough on the photography side of things that we could switch it up a little bit this episode. And uh, that's exactly what we did. And Scott being the pro that he is and the awesome fella that he puts out there and I felt just gave from the heart without a bottom and I really appreciate it. In fact, folks, the chat ended up going about an hour and a half long, so I was tempted to dump it all on uh, this episode, but actually I'm gonna split it in two. So stay tuned next week for part two of the chat with Scott Kelby. And uh, obviously I hope you enjoy part one, hey? And that's coming up in a bit. 
Before that, well, I'm not going to linger on the preamble too long. I think you guys want to hear what Scott has to say, and I would not blame you in the least. I guess if you are new to the show, I just want to point out that Scott's not the first photographer who's dropped by this photo life and chatted to yours truly. Barrio Nex Pirello, Valerie Jardin, Rob Knight, Maddie Holder, Ian Van Landout, Peter Clairhout, and others... They've all been on the show before and shared a lot of their uh, photography thoughts, lives, etc. So you might want to check out those past episodes, especially the last few that were done in 2018. Uh, beyond that, why don't we get to the interview? Scott really, like I said, just gave it out, and I think you guys are going to enjoy this. Uh, there is some photography advice peppered around, as you can imagine. It would be ridiculous to talk to someone of Scott's caliber and not end up uh, chatting photo philosophy and thoughts. But I will warn you guys, uh, we do dip into the personal side, including his faith as a Christian. And that's not really something to warn about, but I do want to mention it just in the sense of, you know, we are going to talk photography, but we're also going to talk personal live stuff. And if you really don't care or even get offended by uh, talking faith, faith and everything like that next to the camera, well, either be warned or just don't listen, hey? Come on. We're talking from the heart here and that's going to come up and uh, that's part of why I was so glad Scott was on the show. All right, why don't we get to it? BS, start firing up the music and getting the roll ready on the sound. DJ BS takes care of us each and every time here on This Photo Life and we are grateful for it. In fact, I'm going to throw out soundcloud.com forward slash BS as the way to check out his tunes a little more deeply. And, uh, well, if you're checking things out and I'm plugging stuff on the uh, outro of this intro, I will, of course, remind you folks that I am Photo Tour Bruges, the daily walking tour here in beautiful Bruges, Belgium. I do daily walking tours of the uh, open and private variety, so if you're on a budget or you can splash out, we got something for you. And, of course, with up to four photo tours available daily, I like to think we have something for your camera too. So beginner to pro, do not be shy to drop by Photo Tour Bruges. And uh, if you look in the description of this episode, you'll see a code for 15% off any of my tours. So check that out and feel free to drop by www.phototourbruges.com, which is of course in the link down in the description. Check it out. And more importantly, gang, now that I've gotten my, uh, my sponsor, which is me out of the way, Enjoy this chat with Scott. Biaz, take it away, my man. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, here on This Photo Life, we have a special guest. Mr. Scott Kelby has dropped by. I mentioned his creds in the intro because I'm not going to mess them up, taking up his time waiting to talk on air. So, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. It's a delight to have you here, man. Thanks so much for making time. You're a star. Oh, you bet. Hey, well, we were talking uh, a little bit beforehand. Um, dude, let's just jump into it. I mean, a lot of us know what you're up to and all that stuff, especially you've had some wonderful interviews out there. Uh, Karen Hutton pops to mind. The interview you did a few years ago with Jared Pollan of Fronos Photo, I think covers a lot of ground. And uh, Barry and X's podcast on The Candid Frame has definitely said a lot. So I'm going to try and not repeat those and instead put those interviews and in links so people can really get a good idea if they want to go deep down on uh, on it. But Scott, let's start with you as a person, man. Um, what's a seven-year-old Scott like? <laughs> let's see. A seven-year-old Scott was in the hospital. Oh. So I had spinal meningitis when I was seven. So I, I uh, almost, almost died. And uh, 
uh, this is back in the 1960s. Yikes. Mm. So, um, yeah, there was, seven was not a great. <laughs> it's weird that you picked seven. Uh, it was not a great time for me, but uh, I did get over it. Uh, almost almost the morning they were supposed to do brain surgery on me because I had, my eyes were were had permanently crossed. Wow. Uh, the morning they were going to do brain surgery on me, they came in to do an examination before the surgery, and my eyes had uncrossed that morning. Uh, and they eventually were able to get rid of the uh, the spinal meningitis. So I, so bad. This is not an awesome way to start the interview. But Great. <laughs> seven, seven year old Scott was uh, was in a funky place. Eight year old Scott now was much better. Okay. Eight year old Scott was was rocking and <laughs> I was, uh, you know back then we we didn't have computers or the internet or anything fun. It was just a stick and a block of wood. But um, the eight-year-old Scott spent a lot of time on his bike riding around the neighborhood with his friends. That was a really big thing was everybody had bikes and everybody was outside. And then the worst thing in the world was is the opposite of what kids today would, would be to be indoors for any amount of time where you were not eating. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you came home for a meal and you grabbed it and you grabbed your bike and went right back outside. So the eight-year-old Scott was on the move on an orange Schwinn bicycle. Superb. I a like banana it. seat, by the way. That was very cool back then to have a banana seat on your bike. They came back in for good reason. Dude, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, I picked a bad number, but it gives us a peek, and then you get to see you running around after. Awesome. Huh. Wow, that's serious business. The uh, the photo gods kind of dropped by for your exam, didn't they? Right at the last second before Man, brain surgery. Man, at the last second, the morning of the surgery. I remember the surgeon coming in and saying, all right, how many fingers do you see? He's holding up two fingers, and I said two, and he's like, Okay, Scott, you're, you know, he's not, you're just saying that because you don't want brain surgery. I'm like, you're right. I don't want brain surgery, but I only see two fingers and son of a gun. He looked at my eyes and he's like, he was like son of a gun. Ah, uh, that's so, beautiful. Man, yeah, so it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's excellent to hear. And we would have been deprived of, of the whole Kelby One experience with that, with that, that going on. Yeah, because they would have taken out all the good brain parts, I think. All the, <laughs> all the good stuff. But, uh, we got to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> good one. Uh, okay, well, here, let's jump ahead a few years then. Um, what's it like when you're around like teenage years? 15, 16? Are you out and grooving? Is photography in your life? Oh, not yet. Not yet. No, at that age, I was all about drums. I was a drummer, and drumming was my life. Uh, I was in marching band and jazz band at high school. I had started my first uh, rock band, and the name of the band was Phoenix. And here's a here is weird a weird thing. So I was 16, and I'm I'm playing in this band Phoenix, and I'm playing with guys that are a little older than me, like the next year. Like I was a junior in high school, and they were seniors in high school, and uh, we still play together for our high school reunions to this Excellent. day. Like I just played with them like a year ago. Same guys from high school back in 1970 something. We get together, we have one rehearsal, and then we play the gig because we went to a big high school, tons and tons of yeah. thousands of kids. And so we go and we play. We play the same songs we played back then and a couple of new ones. And uh, I'm st I'm I don't think of myself so much as a drummer, but I play drums in that band, and so I still play drums. I have a drum kit here at the house, and yeah, we go and play. And uh, it's it's the reunion that we play is not my my year; it's the year uh, before me. So my wife calls my gig the not my reunion gig. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell her, I go, honey, guess what? We're doing the not reunion gig. And she's like, oh, do I have to go? And I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this time I brought my brother, his girlfriend, and some friends. And we actually, they had a wonderful time. And they danced all night. And it was, I, I really enjoyed it. It's fun seeing my friends from when I was literally in high school and still playing the same songs back that we did back then. It's And it's funny because we get together and it's like we, we we never yeah. stopped like it only takes one rehearsal because we all know the songs and it's just you know we were a really tight band back then and it, so that's the the weird weird thing from my 16 17 year old huh. teenage years and you get reminded of it yearly when you do this reunion all the synapses activate up towards that and you got music to kind of lock it in eh? 
Yeah, we and we don't do it every year. We do it every few years. They, I don't think they can tolerate us at the reunion every oh, year. Oh, so they but, do it uh, yearly. They just only you know they give in every few years. Then. <laughs> yeah, every few years they're like, "You guys want to do it?" You know, like for the big years. It's been you know fifty years. Let's just that's not fifty. It's been uh, thirty five. It's been a lot of years since since I was in high school. So <laughs> awesome, man. Good. Well, that's good stuff. And you have a love of music. You you ended up in a band for twelve years, didn't you? I presume that wasn't at 16, but tell me, please. Yeah, so after I uh, got out of school, I went to college, and I switched from uh, drums to keyboards. So back then, synthesizers in the 80s, synthesizers were a big, and if you had a synthesizer, you could get a gig. Like, everybody needed a keyboard player, and keyboards were expensive, and so if you had a keyboard, you worked. So I uh, started playing in a disco band, and I... Went to when I was uh, 19 years old. I went to uh, Greece to the island of Corfu and uh, played there for a whole summer, and then came back and went, you know, through the northeastern United States and played up there, and then back down to Florida. And I played in all kinds of different bands. I played in a country band. I played in a lot of top 40 bands that were, you know, playing whatever the songs were on the radio at the time. And uh, did that for a number of years and really enjoyed it, really had a lot of fun. Uh, I love to play live music, and I still have a band to this day called Big Electric Cat. And we uh, will often play, like we are this year, at the uh, the attendee party at Photoshop World. It's the same guys I played with back in the 80s. And we get together and play a bunch of you know classic songs. We play some new ones, too. We always pick a couple of new ones, but... Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I love music. I, I have a home recording studio. I'm recording all the time. I would probably have two more books done if it wasn't for that stupid recording <laughs> studio. But it, it, it's, it's, I just love music so much and love playing it. And um, my main instrument was drums, and I played keyboards, but now I play guitar and bass. And so uh, being able to play all four of those is really helpful in a studio because you don't have to call other people to play parts. <laughs> you can just yeah. play them yourself. So you can uh, move things along quickly. So that, that's a lot of uh, what I do at late at night. Once everyone's to sleep, I go to the studio and put on my headphones awesome, and away we go. Awesome. And hey, man, you know, you might have lost two books, but you probably gained 10 books worth of therapy. You know, I find you got to unplug <laughs> the, the work side and then do the other stuff, whether it's work as passion, work as work, whatever. It's just just recharge the brain by stepping away from it. Eh? So, hey. And, and I do. I, when I'm when I'm working on that, I'm not thinking about anything else. Like I'm not thinking about any any work or meetings or business or whatever. I'm just I'm into the music, and it, it really is. It's it is very yeah. therapeutic. Do you get a, um? I don't, we're going to get into camera talk and all that side of things a little later. But um, just <laughs> while we're on that page, do you find people use photography for therapy? Oh gosh, I, I could tell you stories. I could tell you heartbreaking stories of people that I've met that uh, that it, it one way or another saved their life. I mean, they they were going through a divorce. They're going through uh, cancer treatments. They have life, you know, debilitating medical issues. And being able to study photography and know that when they got past this, they'd go out and take the new things that they've learned. And oh, I've got so many stories. I've been at, at seminars and people come up and they tell me their story and we're both crying and we have to hug. It's it's I, I think that photography means so much to so many people. I mean, it's it. It is, yeah, it is a hobby for, for a lot of people, but it, it's an art. And, and being able to create anything it can give you such a sense of joy and purpose and meaning. And also to be able to record your the history of your life. It's the visual. Every time you press that button, it, it's another visual history of your exactly. life moment. And uh, I, I think that, that photography, for so many reasons, it, is important in the big picture, obviously, for for news and historical purposes, but as an individual, photography is is a very important thing, and it's it's why I, I love my job, and we talk about this quite a lot at work. Is that you know we're not building widgets, we're we're doing something by teaching photography. We're helping people to do something they love, that they they really really love, like they're so passionate about it and they're so excited about it. And when you make them or help them to be better at it. You're making their lives better. You're you're really making people happy, and it's that's that's a great business Absolutely. to be in. You're so on the nail with that, man. I see with my work as photo tour Bruges, I'm uh, I'm I'm blessed enough to have like two thousand guests pass through the door, and just the way 
you help them and you see them enjoy and sometimes you're like firing that fire up i do open tours that are pretty modest yeah. price so i get sometimes smartphones who are just like i have a small interest in photography and uh and you show them the world and you go like hey with your smartphone if you stand there instead of there and do this instead of this look at the result and then you just see them spark off it's it's oh yeah it's the biggest yeah. joy of the job and knowing that they're getting some recharge out of it too i mean that's 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 just priceless, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, these are for for a lot of us. These are the things that that really, really matter in life. It's it means it's yeah. art, you know. It's it's and and it's personal, and you're seeing the you're showing people how you see the world. It's it's just an awesome thing. It's uh, it's it's. I think it is incredibly important. I think it's more important than we give it credence for i think you know i think we just go oh yeah we're photographers i take pictures whatever but i think that the way it impacts people's lives is is bigger than yeah, we know a, well we're gonna go get back to personal but i can't let that one go i'm amazed sometimes how the this planet and species undervalue the value of a photo right now our industry has changed to the point that you know the writer's already having trouble getting paid and we're not for the cover photo that catches your eye in the newsstand or digitally, that that sells the paper. Or when you have a wedding and the cake is gone, the love is gone, but you at least have these photos of happier times. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's the it's the you know the it's the historical coverage of that key day in your life. Yeah, it's it is weird. It's it's I think one of the reasons, unfortunately, that 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 some of that photography is devalued is everyone is carrying a camera at all times. Yeah. And, and uh, you can take a really nice photo with an iPhone. Uh, there was a time where we, you, you looked at him and go, wow, that's crap and all. But now you look at him, you, you see some of the things that, that people are doing with their iPhones and you're like, holy cow, that's really good. It's, I mean, the, the phones that are in today's iPhone, I mean, the cameras, pardon me, that are in today's iPhones, are far better than the digital cameras people were using 10 years ago that were the best cameras out there like this is the, they were so noisy and they were so awful and so low megapixels and now you're thinking you know this camera that's in your pocket today is double the megapixels and less noisy and it has all this post processing software and it does amazing things like you know like the portrait mode on an iPhone yep. and things it's it's but but unfortunately, that democratizes it. There, there used to be a time where you had to learn a it was a real craft to learn how to get to set your exposure. Like you had you couldn't just anybody hand anybody a picture a camera and they took a picture. They would be awful, you know. Now you know the cameras do, they're so automated. They do so much. Your phone does so much that I think there is this overall feeling that anybody can take a good picture. Which is that's not a bad thing mm. to think, but but I think that when you think anybody can do this, why should I pay for it? My uncle, my uncle Bob's got a good camera. Why don't I have him shoot the wedding? You know, so there. Unfortunately, there there is that, and to some extent, it is certainly hurt the business of photography. But there's two sides of it. There's the business of photography, and then there's the creative side, and they're they're very dis, you know separate. But um, yeah, it's just it's so democratized and it's so everybody does it. My daughter's got a phone. My son's got, I mean, a camera. My son's got a phone camera. My wife has a phone camera. Thousands and thousands of pictures. I have like thirteen thousand iPhone pictures yeah. on my iPhone. It's like it's everybody can do it. It doesn't take a special skill. It doesn't take studying. It's just like here, you press this button right here. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's an yeah, app. Yeah, absolutely agree. You know, I, I have noticed on the flip side of things, um, maybe this is just the optimist in me, but I've noticed by being flooded by, what is it, a billion images uploaded every minute? Is that right? Something like yeah. that. It's insane. I mean, we're producing so much as a species, it's getting thrown out there. First off, on a positive note, I found it's opened up photography and given it a little value as far as the exposure of, you know, letting people like yourself and so many other great photographers put their work out there without having to publish a book or whatnot. Uh, and on the other side, um, 
you get your wedding done by Uncle Bob. You see the results Uncle Bob does because he's not a trained pr- proper photographer, and we could talk gear next to that too. And then when that first wedding might pan out, and you're at your number two, you maybe pay the thousand bucks for someone who knows what they're doing to be there and gets get you photos that'll make it stick, huh? Eh? I know, but you know what's bad, and this is a a disheartening part of all of this, is you hire Uncle Bob, and they go, Uncle Bob did a pretty good job. Like that's they're they're not. It's not like the consumer is so discerning that they go, we made a huge mistake by hiring Uncle Bob. Most of the people that I've talked to that have hired Uncle Bob were perfectly happy with Uncle Bob, and they go, man, we saved a ton of money. We were going to spend. We talked to a professional photographer. He wanted three thousand dollars, but this guy in my IT department at work said he'd do it, and he did it for free, and the pictures look awesome. And you're like, yeah. oh, but they're not. Oh. But they're not. <laughs> I know, I know, but they don't know that, and if they don't know that. You have to wonder: Should they have paid three thousand? It's it's a weird. It's just a weird time. It, it just is, is. It is. But hey, man, that's that's all good stuff. And let me not get too far from asking you a couple questions on you. Um, you re, you were just oh, talking yeah. about music. Um, well, I think it's worth a mention that that's where you met your wife in the band, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was. Uh, we I was playing in a band, and we lost our singer. And one of the guys had had known about. Uh, my wife singing another band that had broken up and he said, I don't think they're working. I'll give her a call. And, and she walked in the door of my house. This is my apartment back, you know, in the day. And, uh, she walked in and I was like, yo, <laughs> no. and then her boyfriend walked in right behind her. And I'm like, Oh God. So it took me a number of years to get rid of that boyfriend, but it worked. Good boy. That's the play. <laughs> <laughs> Got rid of him and, been we're married 30 years this year oh fantastic and congratulations those numbers matter big nice (laughs) man good good and you have two beautiful children i hear so things went well on the offspring oh yeah we have awesome awesome kids we have a a, a 13 year old daughter who is just she is a carbon copy of my wife she's super creative she's an artist she's a dancer She's got a great voice. She's funny. She's just, she's a, she and my wife are like versions of each other. She's like a mini me of my wife. Mm. And my son is a mini me of me. Oh, poor guy. He's he's a musician. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, he's he's a much better version of me. He's way better. He's version 2.0, maybe 3.0. Okay, you paid the upgrade. Good man. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. He's he's very handsome. He's very tall. He's very smart. Uh, he's about to graduate from uh, four years at the University of Alabama, mm. and uh, he's he's yeah, he's definitely a better version of me for sure. <laughs> Excellent, man. Excellent. Cool. Well, um, hey, let's let's cruise forward without, without any any uh, any loss of time or, too, or me stuttering too much. I have not had as many years in the industry as you to uh, perfect my rhythm. <laughs> uh, well, one question I want to ask while we're sort of in the music end of things, because I don't know if we'll get back there. Man, this is something I noticed from um, from seven years of putting away the camera and chasing uh, records and crowds as a DJ. Um, do you find that the same parts of your brain are working in photography as they are music? Well, yeah, I, I certainly think that if you're a creative type of person, yeah, like for example, at our office, there are so many people who are designers, web designers, graphic designers, videographers and all that are musicians. Like I know so many people that, that are, that are popular photographers that are also great musicians. And, and I'll just name a few just off the top of my head. So let's look at Frank Dorhoff. Yes. Uh, who's, you know, lives uh, in the Netherlands. Frank is a smoking guitar player. He is? Cool. Like, oh, he is a brilliant guitar player. I mean, he's, he's not just like, I can play. Frank smokes. Like, he's he can shred. I mean, the guy rocks. You know, um, Mark Heaps, who's one of the teachers of Photoshop World. I mean, he's a great bass player. I mean, really, really good. Rick yeah. Salmon went to the Berkeley School of Music. No Rick way. Play- I know Rick plays bass, Rick plays guitar, acoustic guitar, electric guitar. There are so many people in this industry. Matt Kluskowski is a good guitar player. Uh-huh. Uh, 
Sam Haddix, who is, uh, you know, Kaylee Greer, the dog photographer, uh-huh. uh, her fiance, he went to the Berkeley School of Music. He's a rock and guitar player. Huh. There are so many people out there that are musicians that that you know. You know, Eddie Tapp is a drummer. Um, there's just so many people that are that. It's such an easy crossover from photography to music because if you're a creative person, uh, I think that it runs through your life. I think that it is it is a <laughs> kind of a part of you that that isn't isn't bound to the thing that you're creative at at this point. Just like my daughter who who can draw and who can dance and do all these different things and she has her own YouTube channel and she makes videos and she does all these different things. Mm. Um, she uh, she's not just an artist or just a dancer or just a YouTuber. You know, she's all these different things. And I think that that if you have that creative side to you, that it's not uncommon to find great photographers who are also great musicians or great artists or great painters. I think it is a, it's a side of you that, that you can expand if you want to pretty easily. Huh. Yeah, yeah. The cross-pollination happens, doesn't it? There's a lot of actors uh, who are also deep into their photography and, oh, mus- yeah. and musicians, too. Have you ever seen Brian Adams' photography? Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, he's amazing. He's I know, and really I love Brian great. Adams. You just like him because he's Canadian. Well, but. it's the law. Yeah, of course, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but uh, so my, my the first concert I ever took my wife to, because uh, she was singing in a band but had never been to a concert, was Brian Adams. And uh, huh. we were there uh, w- uh, when he filmed, uh, the, he filmed the night we were we saw his concert. He was filming a video for MTV for one of his, his songs. So it was kind of neat that we were there right to see that. Cause we had to listen to play the same song five times. But because uh, it was in a concert video. But yeah, Brian Adams is a great photographer and, and obviously a great singer, songwriter, composer, guitar player, mm. and, uh, and cool Canadian. Hey. He's had a Tim Hortons or two. I hope so. Jeez. <laughs> that's also in the law. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, you know, I, I was in Canada just recently. I was, I was shooting a, at a landscape workshop here about a month ago. Yep. Uh, up in uh, Alberta in the uh, the national park up there, Jasper mm. and Banff. Mm. And uh, I went to my first serious Tim Hortons, and man, I'm a believer. Their coffee and their goodies are incredible. Um, I, it, I understand why Canadians are so crazy about it. It is an awesome, awesome chain of coffee and goodies places. No, I uh, I definitely top up every time I go home. And yeah, it's an institution in Canada. It's like... Yeah. It's a it's it's a thread of the Canadian life. Is Tim Hortons? Oh, dude, my grandfather took me to Tim Hortons. That's probably part of why I love it so much. Yeah, and I think even flag waving aside, I think their stuff's good. The sugar hits it's, right. The coffee goes good. down and activates. That's Ooh, what I mean. I went. I went like five times while I was there. In four days, I went five times to Timmy's. Yeah, that happens. Good. Good. You should soak in the culture, not just on the <laughs> photos. <laughs> Hey, and if it helps for the next visit, I, uh, I've made this joke off air on tour a thousand times. I should put it on air for you. Uh, Canadians all have a microchip in our necks forcing us to be friendly. So, Yeah, no, it's good. It's awesome. It's a wonderful place to visit. It's a wonderful country, and you're, the people are super nice. But I think that in reality, the reason they're so nice is because of Tim Hortons. Oh, so you've thrown it back to Tim's? <laughs> it's, it's like a boomerang. You'd be grumpy without your coffee, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's beautiful, man. Uh, all right. Well, that covers some ground. Cool. Um, hey, speaking of things, uh, things that make our lives uh, just that little bit better for for hits of of push and light. I'm gonna I'm gonna swing it back uh, another way, man. Uh, it's still on the personal. You're you're a man of faith, aren't you? You're a, a proud Catholic, even to the point of doing a non photography book, haven't you? Okay, I, I'm I was I, I was born and raised Catholic. Uh, I I'm not really Catholic anymore. I'm just kind of a non denominational Christian. Okay. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah, for the I correction. went to Apologies. I went to Catholic school for a couple of years and. Uh, and all that, but uh, I was able to convince my parents to take me out of Catholic school. Catholic school, when I went, was was tough. It was a tough. It was a tough school. The and, old school uh, with the nuns. 
Yeah, the nuns. The nuns were tough, and and I could tell you stories. But uh, I was able to convince my my parents to let me go to public school, huh. <laughs> and uh, so they did. After third uh, uh, third grade, and I, and it's, when I was in second grade is when I had that spinal meningitis. So I think that they were kind of oh, let's let him go to regular school, and so they they took me out and and uh, but so then uh, I I just kind of became more of a mainstream Christian than a, a Catholic. Uh, Catholicism is a hard it's a hard it's a hard religion to toe the line huh. so uh i i i'm i'm in a in a just kind of non-denominational and i go to a non-denominational church and it's awesome and huh. and uh we we can dress casual and it's got contemporary music and it's a lot of fun so yeah it's it's a it's an important part of our whole family's life it's it's it was something we all grew up with and uh and we, and we love it it's 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 part of what makes our family our family so we we dig it that makes tons of sense, man. And thanks for the clarification. That's good to know that uh, you got away from the nuns with the rulers. <laughs> yeah, they were they were mean. <laughs> yeah, my wife went through some of that, and she uh, does not have pleasant things to say when nope. the nuns pass through Bruges. Nope. Nope. Anyways. <laughs> ah, interesting. And if you wouldn't mind, man, tell me about the book you wrote a few years ago on, on Christ, if you feel like talking about it, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it was it was a weird thing. Um, so one, one morning I... Yeah, I was taking my son to school. We had this long commute that we took to school in the mornings. Uh, and I took, I was taking him to school and I'm driving back. And I don't know why this, I was thinking about some friends of mine. They're, they are such good people, like really good people. And, but they're, they live their lives. Like you would swear that they were Christians. They're, you know, they just figured, Oh, they're Christian, but they don't have any faith side to their life at all. And I'm like, man, I, I, I wish wish I could help them, you know, because I, I think it helps you in so many ways having that that kind of grounding and that kind of basis in your life. And I think it's just an, an awesome thing. And, you know, when there, there are people you love and you care about, you want them to have, you know, this you've got this great thing and you want to share it. It's like when you find a really good restaurant. It's like when you the day you discover Tim Hortons and you want to tell everybody about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just you have this thing that you think is awesome and you want to tell other people about it. You want to share and, it. You want to share yeah, it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not like it. an evangelist kind of guy. That's just never been my thing. You know, it's like I, my faith has, has always been you know just kind of a thing for me and my family. I don't go and tell people, hey, have you heard about God? You know, I, I've just never been that guy. And so I'm thinking to myself, man, I wish there was a book or something I could give them that would explain to them about you know Jesus and all this different stuff. And I wish I wish there was something. But the problem is, and, and this is what I saw the problem was that. So if you don't believe in the Bible, yeah. every book every book about Jesus says, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. But if you don't believe in the Bible, you can't even use the Bible as a reference. It's like, yeah, I don't believe in that book. So it's kind of like, you know this book you don't believe in? Well, here's what it says. And I thought, man, there's just no book out there that's like that. There's no book that does isn't based on here's what the Bible says. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I wish there was a book like that. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. I'm supposed to write this book, aren't I? Oh, crap. I'm not very good at this stuff. Like, I realized I, I'm, I'm, I didn't go to seminary. I'm not a super, I mean, I, I'm not a super religious uh, theologian kind of guy. Like, And if I may just pause and ask, um, what point of, was this in your career? Were you up and going writing photography books? Oh, yeah. This okay. is, you know, eight years ago, something like that. I thought so, yeah. Yep. Just wanted to yeah. check. Thank you. So, yeah, and so I just realized, and I didn't hear a voice or anything, but it just hit me like, oh, no, you're supposed to write this. And, I'm, and I felt, and I'm, of course, I'm not qualified to write it. And I'm like, oh, no. And I realized that this book had to be a book that doesn't quote the Bible. Yes. And so that was going to be really tough. But luckily, so uh, the guy who bought me my first Bible ever um, was uh, is a good friend of mine that I still work with. And he had gone to seminary, so he had been to, you know, God College. <laughs> and then I'm very tight with the pastor from my own small church. We go to a small church, not a big mega church. It's a small church. Uh -huh. And he's a great, great guy. And I and I, I knew that they would help me. So I got home and I called them both up and said, look, I'm, I'm supposed to write this book. And would you help me? And they were like, absolutely. And it took me probably two years to write the book, which is bad because it's not a very thick book. It's a very thin book, 
but um, compared to a it, photography book, how long would that take? Oh yeah, you? yeah, three months. Three months. Yeah. So two yeah, years three versus three months. Interesting. Yeah, it took a lot of time. Mm-hmm. But uh, when, when you can't quote the the Bible, mm-hmm. it really makes writing about Jesus very hard. <laughs> <laughs> No it, makes, it makes it really a challenge where you can't even mention it. I do have one page where I say what a Bible is, like here's what a Bible is, but I don't ever quote it. And I don't quote scripture and I don't have anything that God said this or Jesus said that. Yeah. It's really, really challenging. But um, it, it took a I mean, I, I spent so many days where, where I would meet, you know, my pastor or my buddy and we would sit there in a Starbucks and we would just be there for eight hours just – you know, going back and forth and them, you know, they are, they're experts in, in the religious side of it. And they were there to make sure that I didn't say something that was wrong or that was just, you know, that theologians would go crazy because they knew mm. the people that will be angry about this book are not people that don't believe in God. They are people that do believe in God, but they believe in a very specific version of Jesus mm-hmm. that Jesus is this and Jesus is that. And, 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 and it's sure enough, the people that are critical of the book are not not people that are looking for Jesus. Mm. It is people who are Jesus experts. And they just, just like when people get angry with a Photoshop book or a photography book. If I write a book and someone thinks, and they, they think they should be writing the book. And they were like, I can't believe Mr. Kelby left out hyperfocal distance and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, they obviously already know what it is. Yeah. They're complaining that you left off a thing that they know about. Yeah. And so your, your critics don't wind up being people that you wrote the book for. Your critics wind up being people that want to be book writers. So I knew that going in, and they knew that going in, and they thought, we don't want your book to get destroyed by the meanies, you know, the the, the haters that will just pick it apart for whatever reasons. So I, I honestly think I, I've been really blessed in that it, it, it didn't get – I didn't get roasted from it. I didn't mm. get – you know, in fact, it was weird. So many wonderful things have happened to that. I've had people crying in my arms telling me about this. This book changed everything for them. And now they'd always had this like hole in their life. And now they're they're fulfilled and they're happy and everything I wrote the book for. Mm-hmm. And I've heard it again and again and again. And I get such wonderful notes and emails. And so I guess I was supposed to write it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I got really lucky or blessed or whatever you want to call it that I, I didn't get assailed the way I was afraid. My wife told me, and she said, honey, if you write this book, it, you're going to catch a lot of heat, and you're going to catch heat from Christians. But, um, yeah, so uh, it's it, that was it, the whole thing was just kind of a weird out-of-body experience for me to, to write it. It was something I never expected to do in my life, and um, I, I'm glad I did it. It was a really tough two years, and there was a lot of hand-wringing over it and stuff, but – you know, when you read those letters of how it changed people's lives and people come up and tell me their personal stories and all, it's just, it makes me cry. They're crying. We're all crying. It's, you know, and I don't, I don't cry all that much, <laughs> but at least there are tears of joy. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, it was just, it's just the whole thing was very weird to me because I never, you know, I always grew up having a relationship with God. I just never thought of myself as the guy that would ever write a religious book. I sure. just never thought of it. Just. It it's just weird. Your math. The whole thing is weird to me. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting, and it's man, it's good to put that stuff out there. You know, I mean, whatever faith you follow, or even if you don't, as long as some energy is giving you comfort at night on some of the harder corners of this reality, that's what it's all yeah. about. You know. Yeah, like um, you know, life is tough enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't, don't want to go it alone. Yeah, exactly. Well, in a related way, and I, and I guess this starts creeping over a little bit into the Cameron work side of things, but how does how does your faith guide you in your photography and your education side of things? And I guess in a related way, do you find it helpful or challenging in the business side of it? Um, only challenging in that I, it makes you try to do the right thing. Mm. and. There have been many times in, in the course of our company where we've had opportunities to do things that, you know, people came to us and said, hey, we have a list of your competitors, full email database, and we'll mm. sell it to you for $5,000. Mm. Well, that, that would have propelled our company to a whole new level to have my competitors list of 200,000 names or whatever, you know. Yep. But the, the faith in you says it's not the right thing to do. And we're just going to pass. And even though we know that it probably would have made us millions of dollars, 
it, it, it's not the right thing to do. And I, I don't think that your your business or your life gets blessed by doing the wrong thing. I think that so it, it has been a guiding light in our company for for. There's three owners. There's myself, my wife, and our dear friend Gene. And Gene was, <laughs> Gene's been our friend so long. Gene was at our wedding. Beautiful. So, Beautiful. Um, and 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 Gene is a woman of faith. She's very involved in her church and mission work, and she's constantly in Africa and doing you know things to help other people. She so supports what we've done with uh, the orphanage that we've built in Africa, which is separate from what she does in Africa. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, we make a lot of decisions based on is this the right thing? Is this the by our faith should we be doing this? And and it it has kept us on the right path. And I think that that. The right path isn't always the path with the most money. It's, but you know, it's the right path. Yeah. So I think that in business, it, it has certainly helped us to know this is the right thing or this is the wrong thing, and to keep us off the wrong path. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's that's. I mean, it, it, you can just say, well, that's just basic morality. But I, I think that it goes actually a little deeper than that. Um, morality is easy. You know, this is morally wrong or morally right. But people will still make a lot of morally wrong choices. Yeah. So, so I I think it does. It it keeps us grounded and it keeps us, you know, it's our our whole company is. And I know this sounds corny these days, you know. It's like, but we really do try to do the right thing. We try to uh, make our members so happy, you know. It's like we try to delight them and we try to do good things. And if there's a fork in the road and one way is the right way, we always try to take the right way. And it's just. I, I think it has done a lot of good, and I think we've gotten a lot of good. I think it is a boomerang effect. You put good things out there, and good things will come back to you. And if you yeah. put bad things out there, those bad things find a way to catch up with you. And I also think a lot of people, when they look at someone's life, let's say that they look at a, a mobster or a drug lord or whatever, and they're like, man, that guy's got it all. He's got all this money, and he's look, he's doing these bad things, but he's got millions of dollars. Hmm. But you have no idea how what that person's life is really like. Mm-hmm. You're just seeing it from the Facebook view of their highlights of their life, not the the awful things and the misery and the other things that a lot of people deal with that that you know live on a bad life. You know, it's so it's. I think it's. I think having this in your life, it, it, we're all on a path. We're all going somewhere. I think it helps you stay on a good path. It is very easy to get off on a bad path. And I think that your faith is a constant reminder to stay on a path that leads you to happiness, leads you to helping other people, leads you to making the world a better place. Yeah. And yeah. and I think that's that's one of the best things that faith does is it keeps you on a path to a, a happy and fulfilling life and to making the people around you happy and fulfilled. I think making other people happy makes you happier than making yourself happy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Spoken like an educator too, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's my thing. <laughs> uh, does it influence your photography? I've read and I cannot, I mean, I've experienced it in a, not a multi-denominational way of just the beauty of life and the joy of creation inspiring my photography. Do you feel that? Yeah. You know what it does? Yeah, but it does it in a different way. Do you know what it makes me do? Mm-hmm. When I'm in some incredibly beautiful place and I'm photographing it, it makes me stop and not take a photo uh. and, and enjoy where I'm at. And just so I think that's one of the things that it does. Because when I go to an amazing place, like here I'm up in Canada and it's so beautiful and it's so amazing. And you're just like, you know, you're looking at this incredible scene that, you know, it, 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 I, I, you just want to shoot, 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 and I think what what the <laughs> what that faith does to my photography is is make me stop and say, you need to stop and enjoy this moment and this place and all without it being a a thing. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like all about the photo for a material object, result, whatever. Yeah, it, it lets you stop and go, you know what? You need to stop for a minute and just look at this beauty that God created. And it, you don't have to be capturing it and all that because it, it is wonderful to have these photos and to look back on my trip and all that. But to be there in the moment and to be there to experience it 
as you're standing there and to just soak it in and like, look at the gift that stands here before us. You need to accept it. And so I think that for me, it, it, it impacts me that way. Uh, you know, I, I always try to capture beautiful things. I know that there are, there are people whose their their photography genre is to capture dark and creepy things. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's just what what turns them on. And I don't want to you know there's say beauty that, in the darkness too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I, I I always try to capture beautiful things. But I think the older I get, the more I become aware of how important it is to be there in the moment and to enjoy standing there in front of it as much as you enjoy capturing it with your camera yeah that's important man and that's beautiful that you're doing that that's a big reward for your faith a, a i can't believe how deep how deep we're going in this interview today right this was this is you, we're going in all kinds of uh wild were, places that i don't normally get to talk about you were crazy enough to say yes <laughs> I hope we're doing okay here. If I'm freaking you out, hang no, up the phone. And- I, I'm really enjoying it. I don't know how other your your listeners are probably like get to some camera settings, but uh, <laughs> F11, just use F11. Yeah. F8, F8, no F8, F5.6 or die. <laughs> Well, well, well. There it is, kids. Part one of my deep and intimate chat with Scott Kelby. How about that, huh? He really opened up, and it just keeps giving in part two. Do stay tuned for that. Usually I release this photo life every second Wednesday, but next week I'm going to make an exception. I'm going to release this one week later so that you boys and girls can uh, get your ears into the second part of this fine interview. And yes, we do get a little more into the photography questions in the second part. So stay tuned for that. That'll be next Wednesday. If you're not already, please do make sure to like, share, and subscribe, all that sort of good stuff. I am on Spotify, iTunes, and Google. Google Play under This Photo Life. So, uh, you know, subscribe, at least for that next episode where I keep chatting to Scott Kelby. But until then, my friends, I'm going to wrap things up, put a bow on it, and say see you later. So I'm Andy McSweeney of Andy McSweeney Photography and Photo Tour Bruges. I've already said like, share, subscribe, but hey, I'll throw it down one more time. And uh, feel free to check out my work, either as Andy or Photo Tour or whatever. Until then, my friends, put down the audio, pick up the camera, get out there, and get shooting. See ya!